Another draft physics video presentation. Draftphysics.com and such. Um, important to remember, considering YouTube. So this video should be back on YouTube. Um, I don't like it. <laughs> you know, I don't like going back. Um, but it seems necessary just because it seems the audience is disabled. You know, without their Facebook and their Twitter and their YouTubes. They just can't function on the internet. They need instruction. You know, they need to be directed. They need to be told what to view and all of that crap. Anyway, um, all right, enough commentary. Uh, <laughs> geez, pitiful world, really. Um, all right, so I was thinking that maybe on the website I will post a, um, a video a week that's not on YouTube. Uh, just surmising, summarizing the previous week's videos, something like that, maybe. Um, so anyway, uh, so Stephen Bro's great experiment still hasn't shown up. Um, I guess Stephen seems unaware that he's actually going to be proving Professor Lewin to be full of shit. You know, and a lot of other professors, too, who argue that there's some law that you have to conserve momentum. Um, <laughs> and so, uh... That part will be interesting also. Um, it's part of the reason why I'm so confident he, he's he's not going to come up with this experiment. Because it is just nonsense. The history proves it. And so I'm going to read some more of that. And, um, uh, you know, this controversy shouldn't even be... A, there shouldn't be a controversy in the first place. And if you really look at it, it's just... It's really a stupid argument. Uh, it's Physics should be way above making these kinds of silly mistakes. All right, so I think I'll draw a little. Um, so the essence of the problem is that gravity was the first force that people started thinking about. And yes, gravity does this weird thing that if you want to go... If you want to go twice the speed, that is, you want something to land with twice the velocity, you have to go four times higher than, you know, not just twice. You have to go four, four whole clumps of distance higher, okay, for you to double the velocity at impact. Um, and it has sort of to do with this distance versus time argument. So you could sort of understand that if you threw, if you had friction and you were throwing things on a surface, that there's two things to consider. The time it takes for it to get to a location and finally die, you know, stop moving, and how far it will travel. So you can sort of understand that with velocity, okay, because velocity helps you overcome friction, you can go a very long distance, okay, before you'll stop, um, you know, if you double the velocity. So, because the whole time you're moving, you know, you're moving this faster speed the whole time, you know, I mean, through much of your trip, you're moving twice the speed, so you're covering a lot more distance. Um, but the time won't be any, you know, will only be twice as long. So the distance will be four times, the time will only be twice. And the same thing is true here. It's only two times the amount of time to get to this higher location. So you only doubled the time it takes to get here. You didn't quadruple it. So even though you went quadruple the distance, it didn't take you quadruple the amount of time because you were going much faster. So that's really what the whole thing is uh, is centered on in the sense is that you can focus on time as the important thing. You know, time would only be twice. Or you can, you know, focus on distance. And so if you focus on distance, it looks like, oh, it's four times. And if you focus on time, you, know, you only doubled it. You only doubled the velocity. So this is, I would argue, this is the rational way to view it, is to understand it as a function of time. And this is irrational because it doesn't have anything to do with anything real. Um, you know, the four, four distance is um, fooling you merely because, yes, there's a huge advantage to covering distance if you have a higher velocity. It means you are covering distance at a faster rate. So obviously, um, you're going to cover more distance with more velocity. Um, but it's an exaggeration of real energy. It's not the way to measure energy. Um, yeah, so the real way to measure energy is, um, you know, how much time did it take to get there? Uh, all right, that's enough of that. Just as a uh, 
so, sort of a foundation, but you know, um, just to understand the nature of what was being argued and why there was confusion because some people argued from well, obviously time says what you know is the important factor, and the other people are saying distance is important when they should be saying neither one is important. Just as we know, there's relativity, but relativity doesn't mean things aren't moving. You know, it doesn't mean there's no absolute space. It doesn't do. So it's this taking things to these, you know, jumping to these extreme definitions that is the real cause of the problem. And it's so obviously the cause. I mean, it's so obvious that that's the mistake being made. And, um, you know, that should be the part of the context is, well, let's not have the conversation in a silly way. Let's have it in this rational way where we understand that relativity doesn't prove the non-existence of real motion. And likewise, the difference between how far something travels and how much time it travels, um, you know, that's understandable. So anyway, we can understand that that's the way friction works. And that's the way essentially what gravity is when you're fighting it. It's just a form of friction. All right, so a simple question is asked on Quora. Who invented the formula for kinetic energy? Uh, you know, KE equals one half mv squared. So the first thing you have to point out is, well, that wasn't invented until the 1800s. And so, um, you know, in a sense, there's more than one question here. Who, inv who first thought that this notion was rational? So let's understand what was first invented and for the first hundred years, they didn't think the eight pound bowling ball versus the 16 pound ball. It's bad enough that they currently think the eight pound ball going twice as fast has twice as much energy. I mean, for, for twice as much energy. Back when it started, they thought it had four times as much energy. I mean, they thought an eight pound ball would knock down four times as many pins. Four times, you know. I mean, it's a huge error. Anyway, uh, history suggests that it's engineers. So this is more, this is like the Piro speak. This is just, no, this is just what historians say. Okay, there was no outcry by engineers saying, oh, please, fuck up things more. Have two definitions of the same thing. Please, please, please. I love having two definitions. All right, now, engineers do have to live with the practical world. And the practical world says that velocity will break things. Okay, and that's the truth. Okay, so, um, but the, the truth is also that pressure will break things, right? Putting a very heavy thing, like I, I put an 8-pound ball and a 16-pound ball on top of a soda can. And maybe the 8-pound ball won't do anything to the soda can. And the 16-pound ball will completely crush it, let's say. Let's just say it's the right number. It could be 32, could be some other number. But at some mass the can gets crushed. So to an engineer, this is the key thing, okay, is that there's a huge difference between a not crushed can and a crushed can, but they really don't understand that, oh, okay, it's this certain amount of pressure and the can crushes, and there's not some linear curve. You know, there's a line, and then there's just goes straight up and down where the can crushes. So, I mean, but engineers can even understand that, right? So they don't, you know, <laughs> this shouldn't be a problem to figure this out. It, there's nothing special about this special pressure. There's just everything has a circumstantial point where the system breaks. And, you know, and velocity can break systems. Um, the fast bullet can break through your flesh easy. Our flesh isn't made to, you know, it's the opposite of cornstarch. Okay, it's like clay. Um, it yields to velocity. Uh, it doesn't yield to low pressure, um, slow, low velocities. It, you know, it, uh, it collects it and pushes back, <laughs> you know. So, I mean, you know, but this is all understandable. Um, but anyway, all right, that engineers that have had an easier time grasping the break between kinetic energy and momentum. So, again, how, how do they grasp it? Uh, you know, if you're an engineer and your job is land the lunar module on the moon, the fact is you're going to have to choose one of the formulas, okay? They're both not going to help you. They're both going to come up with completely different answers about how long you have your thrusters on, okay? How long you, you turn the knob, how far you turn it. They're going to give you completely different answers to the question, you know, how much thrust do I use? And so 
how is it in any way uh, helpful to the engineer to be you know obligated to choose one I don't think it that, there's, there's any help there and again so a lot of people argue that NASA engineers when they are navigating to the moon are using kinetic energy formula I would argue they have no evidence of that that they can produce so um, that's just talk all right <clears throat> then have the physicist or the mathematicians as engineers really have had little choice but to accept the world as it is so this is his statement so this is kind of a weird fellow he has as a as a subtitle to his name uh, better that physics wasn't built on top of kinetic energy instead of force which made him seem like oh here's a guy who gets it no it's exactly the opposite and but it's hard to understand exactly why he would write that um, bitter that physics wasn't built upon oh bitter oh bitter no wonder now it makes sense bitter so he's bitter that physics wasn't built upon kinetic energy instead of force. So it, I don't know how how does he think they lost the war here? I mean, it, it appears kinetic energy did win. Anyway, um, momentum have uh, or mathematicians we already did that. Uh, engineers have <laughs> really have had little choice but to accept the world as it is. So let's just understand it's only that way superficially. It only looks like, okay, because it goes further distance. Velocity gives you advantages over things like friction. It's a fact. But it doesn't mean that the object has more energy. It doesn't mean that the object will move more matter. Okay. But its first discovery by the philosopher, so they call him a philosopher, he wasn't any more of a philosopher than any of the other scientists of the time, so it's like calling Newton a philosopher, it just doesn't make much sense, frankly. Uh, <clears throat> so Leibniz. <clears throat> so yes, he first proposed it, and he apparently proposed it the year before the publication of Newton's master work. Um, and, um, you know, and you again kind of argue, isn't that kind of coincidental? But most of what Leibniz did was never by coincidence. He, he, he was a, a, a true showman and propagandist in the sense that it's, there's every appearance that everything he did was to manipulate somebody somewhere. Um, and that's why nobody liked him in the end, I think, um, because I think he clearly was a thief. Uh, but anyway, I think he was a, um, you know, somebody who just re-engineered other people's work. Although even he <clears throat> discovered it. So again, this is not a discovery. Clearly in Leibniz's own, so Leibniz saw what was Newton was working on. He knew ahead of time what it was. Uh, he visited Newton. This is where the accusation comes from that he stole Newton's calculus, is the fact that he had visited Newton. Um, and um, so, and I think the clear implication is, is that Newton was consistent with Descartes, and Descartes was basically, it's a mechanical universe. There's a certain amount of energy put into the universe, and that's all the energy there is, and so wherever it goes, you know, that's just the same energy moving through the universe. And um, and Newton was completely consistent with Descartes in terms of he didn't change any of those simple rules. Okay, uh, and Leibniz didn't like it because it didn't require a god to re-energize the universe. The, 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 there's no god to you know make things happen. <laughs> anyway, discovered it from. <clears throat> Accommodating the empirical efforts of the laws of collision formalized by Huygens and Wren. Now, the laws of collision were, you know, the, debated to some extent. Now, obviously, Descartes had stated a whole bunch of stuff about what happens. Um, observational stuff, okay? Just like Galileo, you know, you bang a heavy thing into a light thing versus a light thing into a heavy thing, all of that kind of crap. And as I pointed out, it's really just about Velocity, you can't make, a slow thing can't make something go fast. Faster than it's going. Just can't do it. All right, so, so the rule is, is that you can't give something a full portion of your momentum if you 
don't have the velocity it's capable of carrying. So if it can't, if you can't make it go fast and it has a limited mass, well then you can't transfer all your momentum to it because it doesn't have the package to hold it. It doesn't have a volume. Um, you won't be able to get the same volume into it. Let's put it that way. So obviously if I bang into something lighter than me, I can push it the same speed I'm going. But if it's lighter, obviously I'm still going to have energy left over. I can't give it all of my energy because I can only make it go the same speed I'm going. All right. Um, so, but those, th those subjects don't get to the nature of energy itself or the nature of the force. So uh, although Huygens was great with pendulums and lots of stuff and did some great science, um, he really hadn't done anything formal on the subject of energy itself. All right, so energy is the fuel that powers momentum. So, okay, maybe. And velocity is merely the basis for measuring its quantity relative to one's position. So this gets a little bit into this relativity crap, which is sort of irrelevant. Um, but we know it's not just your velocity, right? I mean, half the component is what you're carrying, the bucket you're using to carry it with. You know, uh, the, the more surface area you spread the jelly over, the less high the jelly is. So, so you know, but that's, you're always going to be spreading a volume of force on an object and how that volume manifests depends on how much mass you have. So the mass is just as important as the velocity. A, conclu a, conclu a collision which imparts no damage or structural change. So this is the elastic versus inelastic. And so you're just really saying the collision that makes it obvious that the energy has to go somewhere you can see. Okay, it can't go to the subtle changes inside the objects to the objects involved also transfers its momentum with the true force of the kinetic energy contained therein remaining hidden so they never used they didn't use words like kinetic energy so he almost has this like it's a quote this is his own writing <laughs> okay um and um the fact is is that the the transfers are limited based on the fact that slow things can't make slow heavy things can't make light things go fast so they can't transfer and the a complete their com all of their momentum because they just can't push it any faster than they can run fat people can't catch sh short little people kind of argument all right but if structural damage is imparted in any form it is the force reflected by kinetic energy, so more whatever that means, which grows gradually to velocity. Which this is this complete, you made all that up, uh, quadratically, grows quadratically, sorry, uh, which will alter and divide shapes and exert a strong influence on the motions of those objects that remain. So this, like I said, who... This is obviously not Huygens' writing, so this is all just kind of made up. They have the word energy in here. They have kinetic energy in here. It's all just made up because that didn't happen back in the 1600s. It just didn't happen. Those words were not used. All right, so anyway, whatever that was. I mean, I can't even, I can barely even give you any interpretation other than to say, yes, they observe that things go further and therefore... They must have more energy, which isn't true. Okay. It is common shorthand today to group energy and momentum together. So again, they're, I mean, common to who? I mean, what brain could possibly make them the same thing or say it's it, they're both usable or any of that? There's no way to do it. I mean, every circumstance is going to find, you know, and, and you're going to say, I want to get the right answer. So they're almost saying it doesn't matter what answer you get. And yeah, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes for the purpose of what you're trying to accomplish, it makes no difference whether you say it has 100,000 joules or 50,000 joules of energy. It doesn't matter because no one's going to test you. 
you know, no one's going to sit there and find out if it actually has that much energy. It's just for relative comparisons. So if you're making the same mathematical error over here and the same mathematical error over here, and you're just using the two for comparison, no harm done. But if you're really making an absolute statement that's going to really matter, that is, you're going to land a lunar module on the moon, you're going to have to choose one. And that's just a fact. All right. Uh, under the umbrella of Newtonian. So this is just so ironic in the sense that this is invented by the, a guy that became Newton's worst enemy. Um, it has nothing to do with M Newton's mechanics. It's completely against Newton's mechanics. Newton's mechanics was all about momentum. Momentum was perfect. It worked just fine from Newton's perspective. Nothing broken. Um, doesn't need to be fixed. And they're calling it Newtonian, which doesn't make any sense. It just, this is so grossly nonsensical. You're just saying, how could scientists say this is okay to write a history that's this full of shit? I mean, it, it's just so far from being the truth. <laughs> There's nothing Newtonian about MV squared. I mean, it's completely an antithesis. It's, it's the exact, it's, it's, you know, poison. It's, it's. There's nothing it says that isn't in a direct attack against everything Newton believed. All right. Uh, umbrella of Newtonian mechanics when speaking of classical as opposed to relativistic physics. So again, more like this has anything to do with relativity. Galileo invented using the word relativity I mean, as a concept, understanding that we can't really tell which thing is moving. You know, when things are moving, we can't... Re it's like sort of you could say, okay, like if you're on a sailboat, sometimes it would be hard to tell whether the wind was actually blowing or whether you're just feeling the wind from your boat moving. You know, some it would be hard to tell which breeze is a natural breeze and which breeze is one created by your boat's motion. Um, you know, but there is a truth underlying the circumstance that's that would be the argument you would know that yes even though i can't tell whether the wind i'm feeling was a real breeze um i can know that there is a real truth all right physics rather than energy nor kinetic variant was yet known or named during isaac newton's lifetime so clearly it was named in the sense that it was Leibniz's argument. So, you know, whether it was, it was called visa visa or whatever, visa viva, living force. So it was known. Newton didn't like it. <clears throat> uh, Newton didn't argue about it because frankly, um, like I said, he didn't, he didn't even wish to acknowledge um, Leibniz's existence once Leibniz, <clears throat> you know, made his calculus, um, <clears throat> whatever you want to call it, introduction, you know, showed his calculus and therefore obliged Newton to prove that, no, I did it first. <clears throat> you know, Newton had to prove I did, he did it first. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, and then you have to believe that just a coincidence that they both came up with the idea at the same time. Now, Leibniz changed it and to some people's from some people's perspective and proved it, but that was exactly Leibniz's life um, function. He did that to everybody's stuff in the sense that he just took their stuff and rewrote it, okay, into a better song. Um, blah, blah, blah. All right, anyway. It was not generally accepted by a physicist in the decades that followed his life. So the point would be that it's quite obvious that Newton decisively won this argument that no one really had to argue it. And that's why there wasn't much argument is because nobody fell for Leibniz's magical f four times the energy. <clears throat> Everybody thought about it and they said, okay, what's the implications of what you're saying? Well, the implication of what you're saying is, is that an eight pound bowling ball has four times more energy than a 16 pound bowling ball and can knock down four times as many pins you know, whatever the appropriate at the time analogy would be. And they all knew that can't be right. You know, and then they took it a step further and you go to a four pound ball and you got eight times. I mean, it just gets more and more outrageous. The smaller and faster you make the object, the more insane the energy numbers get. All right. 
It was the uh, 16A6 that Leibniz publicly issued his thoughts. So in 1687 is when Newton published, I think, or 1685. I mean, it's within a year of each other. Uh, on Descartes' mechanics and said, okay, so this is a quote from Leibniz, apparently. In so doing, he, oh no, this is again, see, it's a quote of somebody else talking about what Leibniz did. Okay, so again, it's a quote from, this is just a paper, okay, yeah, I remember this. This is a paper written by some woman uh, on what the history was. And I'm just saying, I don't know what value it is. In so doing, he initiated the famous dispute concerning the force of a moving body known as the visa visa controversy. So again, it wasn't really a controversy in his lifetime. That's just the fact. And that's why Leibniz was, you know, had to be buried by his rich owners and was not a celebrated character. Um, he was kind of forgotten. Uh, two concepts now called momentum and kinetic energy, one-half mv squared. So at the time, it wasn't one-half mv squared. It was just mv squared. Eight-pound bowling balls had four times the ability to knock down pins. Were discussed as a single concept. So this is just such nonsense. It wasn't discussed as any single concept. It was clearly seen. Anybody who said... Eh, mv squared was just thought of as being attacking Newton's physics, and that's the way it was looked at, and this is all just bullshit. Force, each differing from Newton's idea of force. So again, there is no differing from Newton. Newton was consistent with the Descartes, and um, the end. And, and unlike Descartes, Newton gave the force uh, a reality by connecting it to gravity. So I guess that would be the big advantage of Newton's physics over Descartes. But uh, on the very concept of the quantity of motion, uh, the idea of there being the, 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 what the function of motion was, both Descartes and Newton were completely consistent. All right, um, for a comparison purpose, Newton's Principia was first published in 1987, so the year later. All right. Um, the German Leibniz was the contemporary peer of English Newton, and both were uh, mere children when René Descartes died in 1650. Despite their geographical proximity and shared interest, the work of each seems to stand independently of the other. Let's understand Newton did visit Newton. Okay, Leibniz did visit Leibniz. Um, so blah, blah, blah. Leibniz and Newton also have acrimonious history over which one of them of the two first invented calculus. Now it was the Royal Institution did the investigation, they drew the conclusion that yes Leibniz was the thief, blah 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 blah. So okay you don't have to take that too seriously because there's does seem a little bias there. But it's clear who visited who and who had the opportunity to steal somebody's stuff, and that was clearly Leibniz. Newton didn't go anywhere, and he never visited anything, and so he couldn't go sneaking around through somebody's papers. And obviously it's a known fact about Newton that, you know, if you came to visit him, there were papers everywhere, okay? <laughs> Newton had his stuff all over the place. Anyway, <clears throat> and it is intriguing to consider living force as <clears throat> something of a second front in their intersections. Um, you know, visa visa means living force. So even right there, a scientist should just have huge pause. Living force, do we really want it? This sounds a little like religion or something. Holy Spirit. I mean, this doesn't sound good. <laughs> you know, right there, a scientist should be really uncomfortable. Um, we're doing living force now. All right, and it's meant to be, I mean, he called them monads. He thought the universe was made out of little souls, solitons. And they're called monads. And, you know, it's a whole freaking religious theory. And that's in the middle of your physics now. And it's meant to be understood against the dead force, um, vis a morta, that is intended to represent momentum. Well, the dead force <laughs> is really intended to represent um, potential energy. See, potential energy is not alive yet. 
It's just, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's waiting to be a soul. <laughs> you know, or whatever. So even that's not correct. Yet, even while visa visa may have come to be seen by those of the day as being in opposition to Newton's own proclamations, it was overtly in opposition. I mean, four times the energy. The eight-pound bowling ball has four times the energy. Newton says they have the same. The, the eight-pound ball going twice as fast has the same energy as the 16-pound ball um, going half as fast. Okay, and now we've gone, now we're at four times the energy. <clears throat> it's not a little difference. It's a gigantic, huge, preposterous, monstrous change in how the universe functions. And they, you know, they just keep, the historians just keep underplaying it, underplaying it, underplaying. This is a gigantic, uh, a humongous, huge difference in perception of how the universe works. Make things go fast and you make more energy. That's what this theory is, <clears throat> where Newton's saying, you can't make more energy. You're stuck with what there is. Uh, Leibniz himself was actually targeting Descartes' notions of momentum conservation rather than Newton's. It really doesn't matter, and one would argue that he was only doing that as a veil, okay, um, when his real target was Newton, because his real statement was, I don't like Newton's physics because, you know, it doesn't have enough God in it, frankly. There's no room for God. Conservation of momentum was still then a new concept in historical uh, standards. I don't think it was at all. They all talked about, you know, the fact that you can't make this energy stuff. That one thing causes another thing, causes another thing, causes another thing. Cause and effect was really understood. <laughs> And this was just a mechanical explanation of that cause and effect. Advanced by Descartes, who himself was unwilling to fully renounce Aristotelian laws of motion. And, um, but clearly, uh, you know, Aristotelian laws are stupid. In the sense, you know, earth, wind, and fire kind of, you know. <laughs> you know, it didn't have anything to do with real physics. Um, anyway, Descartes viewed momentum as conserved quantity delivered by God. Well, the point was is that God didn't have to refill the universe. Okay, he poured in so much and it's already in there and that's how much we have. Um, and while Leibniz may have also harbored a holy origin for his own version of it, it his was in Bued with a more benevolent sense of dynamic life, whatever all that crap could mean. Does that sound like science to you people? His was imbued with a more benevolent sense of dynamic life, <laughs> you know, that is vis a vis a, um, than was um, draconian character of purely conserved momentum, not so tempered. Well, anyway, so that's the real thing that bothered him. The draconian character of Newton's physics. It's draconian. <laughs> yeah. So, so I mean, again, yeah. you're all happy with this history. You're, you're happy that, oh, yes, this was all inspired by these wonderful religious thoughts. It's such good science comes from that. While the combined frame of popularity of Descartes and Newton came largely to overshadow the work of Leibniz. No, the, the acceptance that Newton's mechanics actually worked. He predicted things, the mechanics worked, they explained the universe, the whole, you know, uh, ellipses and all this. The whole thing was all put together in a nice package that worked. A mechanic, you could, you could now model the universe, the solar system anyway, using these Newton mechanics, and you could make a machine, and you could predict where things were going to be, and it worked. That's the fact. Newton won because his science worked. Okay, his thinking in these matters ran very deeply indeed, as you might expect from one of the founders of calculus. So again, this guy is saying that Leibniz did um, invent the calculus. And, you know, it's really quite easily debated. So this is more quotes from the book. The story, okay, the story. So we'll read it. Leibniz's conservation of progress is closely related to the Cartesian law of conservation of quantity of motion and more familiar law of the conservation of momentum. So obviously it is nothing like that. 
obviously because it's a free energy and a free i mean you're losing energy all over the place if you get bigger and slower and you're you're gaining energy all over the place if you get lighter and faster as Leibniz is <coughs> at pains to emphasize uh, no he isn't however his law differs from the cartesian law and <coughs> at least that it um traffics in signed velocities rather than scalar speeds <coughs> So they, they bring up this crap as if it has something to do with anything. When um, <clears throat> a sign is the same thing as, you know, when you, when you put a plus or minus sign ahead of time or you put a plus and minus sign when you decide to do the equate, what's the difference? You're going to, obviously, to do the math, you're going to have to figure out that right is positive and left is negative. Now, you can do it ahead of time and establish a vector, <clears throat> But it doesn't really matter because you can't do the math until you you establish a rule. So saying it makes a difference if I establish the rule three days before or if I establish the rule, you know, one hour before. <laughs> it doesn't matter. So there's no, there's, no, there's no such thing as this distinction. This is just another part of where physics just goes silly. Um, Leibniz is thus able to maintain that although it will be found that the total progress is conserved... <clears throat> or that there is as much progress in the same direction before and after the impact, nonetheless the quality of motion as measured simply by speed times mass is not conserved. So again, just nonsensical gibberish, really. <clears throat> I mean, there was no way to escape the free energy consequences of Leibniz's observation. Now, he would, he would say there's no such thing as free energy and no such thing as perpetual motion, but the implications of what he's arguing are that. So if they had done the spring experiment or some simple experiment where you put energy into a system with a light, fast object, and then you take the energy out of the system with a heavy object, <clears throat> you'll get entirely different definitions of how much energy the system has. So it doesn't work, is the simple truth. It just doesn't work. And it never worked. It was never a good answer. Um... And again, it had to be dug up, okay, three decades after Leibniz's death. The whole thing had to be dug up, okay, as an idea. Well, not that long even. Can't, I can't remember exactly when he died. But anyway, <clears throat> in his essay on dynamics, Leibniz showed how any two of his conservation laws, the third may be derived. So he showed how it's circular, not how it works, okay. Uh, this might suggest that Leibniz sees all three as being on a par with each other. In fact, however, he insists that conservation of living force is more fundamental than the conservation of relative velocity or common progress. So again, to think any of these things have any that, that these are things you can parse and cut into pieces is just kind of silly anyway. There's no conservation of momentum, so to speak, in the sense there's no conservation of mass or conservation of velocity you can change the velocity and the masses of substances all over the place. Well, you could say there's a conservation of mass in the sense that you can't make it out of nothing. So, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, and there's only so much velocity in the universe. Um, there's only so many atoms moving. There's only so many electrons, and they only have so much movement energy, and they have to constantly exchange that and that's all there is so but you don't need three laws it's only one concept the little bits move um, frankly more fundamental than the conservation of uh, a common product his reasoning for prevailing i don't know why they use that word uh, mv squared. So again, let's understand it was mv squared, not one half mv squared, mv squared. So it was making preposterous predictions of how much energy stuff had. In this way, are far from clear. Okay, so they don't even have a clear definition of why he believed it. That's how bad his arguments were. Uh, but he must have recognized them to be necessary metaphysical, necessarily metaphysical. So. The argument is is that he had a belief, he didn't have evidence, he couldn't cite a, a perfect experiment to demonstrate any of this crap. It was just something he believed, um, and he essentially contrived, I suppose, some sort of arguments that were very circular. 
Although the measurement of mv squared is relative to the choice of a reference frame, whatever that could mean, Leibniz probably thought that it had a better claim to tracking an intrinsic property of bodies in light of the considerations he raises in his brief uh, documentation, so a demonstration. Uh, so, um, yeah, so he doesn't give much of an argument. Essentially, the argument was when you throw a light thing into the air at twice the velocity, it goes four times as high. And it's pretty much the, that's the end of the argument. So it has to have four times as much energy because it couldn't go four times as high unless it had four times as much energy. So even though everybody knew that when the feather hits the ground and when the hammer hits the ground, the hammer has a lot more energy, um, you know, Leibniz would argue that, no, the feather has, you know, big piles of energy. Anyway, uh, because it, uh, well, it, it's a bad example uh, because they can't, you can't make them go. You, you have to first start with a feather. You can move twice as fast. Now, obviously, the feather has a problem acquiring velocity because of air resistance, so it's not a perfect example. But I'm just saying the lighter object has more energy. And you know when they hit the ground, the lighter object's not going to have more energy. All right, uh, particular bodies virtue of which they are able to perform work on other bodies are, in the case of a pendulum, on themselves. He thus held the conservation of living force to be the most fundamental overreaching conservation law of the physical world, which is just too silly. Uh, anyway, uh, this just goes on and on, huh? Hmm. Yeah. All right, so maybe we'll take a break. <laughs> yeah. Didn't realize it was this much crap. All right, should be back. All right, so this is where we get into the, now after Leibniz, where the real debate started. So in Leibniz's time, the debate was nothing. Nobody believed it. It seemed like an unusual, you know, just really useless nonsense to change Newton. So some time had to pass from Newton's time uh, where people were willing to start um, questioning Newton, I guess. Uh, many decades after Leibniz's death, belief in living force was far from pervasive. Below is a recountation by Emily du Chartelet, um, the translator of Newton's work into French, who contributed her own impressive efforts to synchronize the thoughts of Newton and Leibniz. All right, there's no way to synchronize the two opposing answers to the same question. You ask, how much energy does it have? They give two fundamentally different answers. There's nothing to synchronize here. It's just, it makes absolutely no scientific sense to say there's some compatibility between the two theories. They're completely and overtly in conflict with each other. In an effort to convince the many contributing doubters, continuing doubters of the living force. So anyway, in this case, this is an, a, a, you know, a verbal thought experiment that can't really be understood and I don't even think is factually correct. But anyway, in the case in which a body A freely suspended in the air whose speed is 2, so you're dropping something at 2 velocity, and the mass is 1, so it's a light thing going fast, at the same time hits at an angle of 60 degrees, B, and B, the mass of each of which is 2. So it says each of which is 2. I don't know, are there are two Bs? I don't know. Uh, for in the case of the body striking, a, it stays at rest after the hit. So they're saying that the lighter thing moving faster stops moving, which I don't think happens, but anyway. And the body's bodies, it says, B and B, whose mass is 2. So it hit two things with double the mass. Um, <clears throat> so at a 60 degree angle, hitting both of them, I'm not sure how, you know, maybe in between the two of them. Um, maybe that's it. And who have each received a degree of speed. So a degree of speed. So we don't give it a 2 or a 1 or a 1 half. And the truth would be they would leave at 1 half the speed. Okay, have each acquired two of force. So, but we don't know the speed, but we know it's a two of force. 
Whichever way one looks at it, thus body A with a speed of 2 communicated a force of 4 at one and the same time. So the assumption would be that the two other bodies were moving twice as fast when, I mean the same speed, and therefore you doubled or quadrupled the energy, but the truth is you didn't because they're going much slower. So, you know. Champions of kinetic energy had to speak loudly to be heard over the many decades after even this writing, however. Um, <clears throat> so why would you be a champion of kinetic energy is the first question I would ask. Why would anybody be championing some kind of notion that there was something wrong with momentum as an answer? What example demonstrates how momentum doesn't work as it does in all these collisions and all this stuff. It's easy to follow the momentum. Why would I, why would I doubt momentum? What, what, what compels one to be a doubter of momentum when everything sort of indicates its conservation and its reliability as a way of understanding interactions? And so why would they go to the trouble to find the one experiment that proves otherwise? It's like, a, you know, you could argue, why would somebody need to believe that light is bent by magnetism? Why would you need to believe it? I mean, why, why, do, why is there some necessity to force it to happen? You have to ask these questions because <clears throat> I don't understand it at all. I mean, I can't, I can't fathom why anyone would have any uh, will or desire <clears throat> to believe <clears throat> that you could acquire more energy from something when you know that can't you can't do that. So why would you want kinetic energy? How, how can it? You know, you, you, I can't imagine the purpose of it. How could it possibly function? How could it? How could the universe make any sense? The squaring of the velocity on the kinetic side uh, <clears throat> of this dichotomous re regulation of motion. Well, anyway, dicta. <laughs> well, anyway, means that a small object moving quickly carries a greater magnitude of force than a larger object moving with equal momentum. <clears throat> and uh, what sense does it make? <laughs> How does that make any sense? It has more energy because it's going faster, and it that doesn't make any sense. As long as collision between objects are completely elastic, <clears throat> as in Leibniz's example above, then the momentum of an object is transferred intact. So again, just more argument about what you see. So you'll see it, okay, if the objects can't deform or in some way move smaller bits inside of them, then you'll see the energy. But that's all. This is just about whether you see it or you don't see it along with the kinetic energy that powered it. <clears throat> and intuition holds, whatever that even means. Where's the intuition in any of this? I mean, you're clearly arguing between two uh, circumstances. You're saying the bowling ball in this circumstance, the lighter ball has four times as much capacity to knock down pins. Somehow it can give its velocity to so many more pins when we know it has to give its velocity. If there's a bump in the in the lane, we know it's going to slow the ball down. Everything the ball is going to transfer <clears throat> has to come out of the energy it has. It can't transfer energy it doesn't have. <clears throat> it can't transfer velocity it doesn't have. But when either party to the collision has a breach occur to its form, i.e. bending, breaking, spattering, squashing, splintering, blah, 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 then all of the kinetic energy acquired from force over distance rather than over time. <clears throat> so again, more of this unnecessary attempt to confuse things by <clears throat> using, not understanding the context that distance and uh, time are ways of appreciating uh, what's what's happening in the universe, but that neither one should be understood as being the only thing that matters. They have to be understood together. Of those objects involved in a collision will influence the consequence of the impact. <clears throat> okay, sorry, my voice is broken. Uh, kinetic energy can be converted into another form like heat. So that's the part I like. Is that well, you know? But this wasn't known until much later. Uh, but total energy must always be conserved. 
So again, obviously the argument is, is that energy must be conserved and you can't put it in any kinetic form and then momentum form and say it's conserved because those are two different answers. <laughs> so until you have one understanding of the mechanism of the transfer of force, um, there's no point in talking about conservation because clearly you have to, if you believe in kinetic energy, you have to break momentum's conservation. And if you believe in momentum, there is no kinetic energy conservation. It is important to note, however, that momentum, the straight unsquared velocity times mass, is always conserved. So it doesn't make any sense. It can't always be conserved if you have such a thing as kinetic energy. When, which inhibits the matter in which energy conservation can be seen. This doesn't even make, you know, doesn't make any sense. And this had therein made kinetic energy a difficult thing for many to recognize and accept for a very long, long time. For a very long time. Today, this is all but forgotten, of course. And why is it forgotten? Because you just instruct everybody that the Holy Ghost exists and they all accept it. And that's all. They're all just sheeple. They'll do whatever their teachers tell them. And... Uh, they won't. Uh, <clears throat> they have no imagination. They have no understanding. All they can do is memorize a formula. They can't understand any of this as a concept. Um, because if you try to make it a concept, you try to understand the concept of what something is actually transferring. That has to be something it actually has. <laughs> you know that it can't transfer what it doesn't have. I mean, you have so much ability to push. It's like you have so much money. And that's all it is. And you can only give, you know, if you have ten quarters, you can, I can give three quarters here, I can give three quarters there, three quarters there, and then one quarter. That's all I got. I don't have any more quarters. I can't make more quarters because I'm smaller or bigger or anything. I, I have a certain number of quarters. That's it. Uh, anyway, it's just too, it's too stupid. The one half <clears throat> in the kinetic energy. <clears throat> so let's understand. He's he's defending this whole stupid, idiotic history when the formula was catastrophically wrong. I mean, M V squared got silly answers. Way off. Not even close. So it was way off. And then it got a little better when they put a half in front of it, but it's still way off. But the point, I mean, it's just so funny that, it, you know, it, here they're defending a history where clearly whatever Chatelet said was bullshit because she was already 100% off. I mean, her number was already a stupid, insane exaggeration of the real energy. I mean, if, you, if she had jewels to work in, she'd be saying it's 10 jewels. And by modern standards, we'd say this, it's only five. I mean, it's a gigantic error. And it's just kind of funny that they all think this is good science. All right. The one half in the kinetic energy formula was only added much later in the early 19th century. That means the early 1800s by Gepard Gustav Coleus. So as you, okay. I mean, there's a whole bunch of different people who first decided to, to use a mathematical construct. But anyway, the need for... The need for which was also fiercely contested. So I'll have to look up that fierce contesting. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to. I'll have to go see where that happened. Um, so it be isn't it, it? Wouldn't that be ironic that by the 1800s they still hadn't figured out that mv squared was silly? I mean, it was such a preposterous exaggeration of any realistic notion of energy. And that somebody would actually contest knocking it down by a half and making it a little closer to the momentum numbers. All right, the final piece of the formula came into focus as the creation of the work energy theorem, which is just again stating we're just going to pay attention to distance and we're going to always talk in terms of uh, constant forces. So we're just going to turn everything into gravity and pretend everything functions has gravity functions that is you get four times the distance so they're you know i mean just they're just being this this is such horrible science okay anyway so i mean the work energy theorem is just stupid it's saying force times distance distance is the only thing that matters well, no it isn't the only thing that matters and there isn't a constant force pushing so why would distance have anything to do with it oh that's right it doesn't have anything to do with it Demonstrating once again how kinetic energy really came to be refined and accepted separately from 
its momental ancestry, largely because reality required it to be defined exactly as it exists. So that just sounds like religion. You know, God says so. <laughs> you know, obviously reality doesn't make it doesn't make any sense in reality. Reality says if I'm at a bowling alley and I throw a 16 pound ball, um, you know, and then I go and I pick up a eight pound ball, I'm going to throw the eight pound ball twice as fast, and but it's not going to knock down twice as many pins. And that's what reality says. Reality says if I take a 10-ton train going 5 miles an hour and I smash it into a big giant spring, it's going to compress it a certain amount with its energy. And then when I replace it with a lighter train, okay, the train is going to leave at twice the velocity. But we know it doesn't have twice the energy. It's still only going to compress the spring the same amount. <laughs> you know, that the two things could just go back and forth on these springs and the same energy will make them both function. Anyway, uh, okay, so that's enough of, you know, there's other comments that are also wacky and silly, but this one really consumed a lot of time. All right, so I'll see what this fiercely contested thing is. But I'll do that in some other video, maybe. Anyway, so uh, till the next ha time and such. So I'll read through all this crap, more crap, frankly. So, yeah, that's enough of a video. It's, uh, sorry, that was, you know, it was a little too uh, minutia. But anyway, FYI, um, no one forced you to watch. <laughs> yeah. I'll try not to over-title the video, just so you know it's maybe a little bit slow. So till the next time and such and so forth and whatnot. This has been a draftphysics.com video presentation. That's it.